Alright guys, this is Cat Alex Mason here and we're going back to this Call of Duty unclassified World War II field manual belonging to Ronald Daniels and we will be focusing on the next following chapter Weapons of War. Again, I'm not going to read the full book because, you know, official release kind of crud. Um, instead, we're going to be talking about the annotations that he leaves like this one. I hope the lessons will be learned from the Maginot Line. And he says, he's referring to this passage, Innovations abound and lessons are learned and applied daily in back and forth struggle for tactical advantages on the battlefield. Um, their first weapon we're going to introduce is the M1911, the good weapon. Hang on, I'm going to get out of the area where there's less of a glare. Um, it says, no need to sell me, I already got me, or I already got one, got me. Um, the short recoil design makes this gun efficient, reliable, and versatile. Um, he also mentioned, like, and underlines the may be interchangeable, may be. I don't know if he's saying that for a grammatical error, or if that's just, like, saying, oh, yeah, you're wrong. Um, we have a schematic of the M1 Garand rifle, like how to take it apart and stuff, and properly clean it and whatnot. Let's see. Um, I'm reading this. As opposed to your what? Yeah, um, I'm kind of reading it by... It doesn't actually say what it's opposed to, or opposing to. Um, but he later mentions yee after examining the specs for, you know, fire rate and whatnot for this gun. Because again... It's the, M that, er, it's the M1 Garand. I actually have a toy one somewhere around here. Um, conventional wisdom at the beginning, uh, and now they're talking about the bayonet. Conventional wisdom at the beginning of the war was that longer bayonet blades were better. Makes sense to me, he says. Um, we scroll down. However, it is unlikely that our forces will encounter mounted cavalry. The cavalry is now made of tanks. Um, note that cutting down bla the blades does not compromise strength. It better not, he says. Now here's my favorite one. The M1903 Springfield. Um, he says, the M1903... Um is a magazine-fed, manually-operated, bolt-action service rifle. This combat workhorse has been serving U.S. soldiers with reliability and s precision since the dawn of the century. Transa er, translation, it's old, he says. Um, we scroll down further, he says... I gotta read. All M1903 rifles in service with our ground forces today were manufactured using enhanced heat treating that has eliminated the previously reported structural weakness in the weapons receiver. Check those serial numbers anyway. Huh. I actually did not know that. Um, he later mentions, um, production constraints have resulted in some M1903A3s being made with two groove rifled barrels or war emergency barrels the reduction in rifling grooves in the M1903A3 will not affect accuracy I'll be the judge of that he says now this one this is a new weapon we've we've never seen this before in a Call of Duty this is the M1941 and this was also used by the Marines which again don't know why um, they weren't featured in the game, but I digress. Uh, despite setbacks in distribu 
or distribution, the M1941 rifle has been embraced by the Special Marine Corps Parachute and Raider Battalions. His, his little annotation. They hug him. The 10-round rotary magazine is a standout feature that utilizes both 5-round stripper clips and individual cartridges and raises capacity to 11 rounds when an additional round is in the chamber. That thing's weird looking, but extra ammo is always good. Uh, M1 carbine. The M1 carbine is a 30 caliber semi-automatic firearm, which means it is a long arm firearm. How about people with short arms, he says. Um, the overall demand for the, US, for the M1 carb, carbine has meant that several diverse U.S. manufacturers, including a typewriter manufacturer and a jukebox company, has, have answered the challenge to produce these weapons. But will the carbines play records, too? He asks. The M1 has a maximum range of 300 yards, but bullet drop makes the carbine most effective up to 200 yards. Just say it has a range of 200, he says. Hey, next. I'm surprised by a lot of Russian weapons that were featured in this game when there's hardly any Russians at all. Let's see. Th this whole thing is just a bunch of... A bunch of pages like there's a crap ton there's a reason why I wanted to make this a separate video this is just nuts this takes up like half the book Th that that's the thing okay SVT 40 this is a Soviet rifle I got exhausted just reading that he says the sandwich I'm not even gonna bother trying to pronounce that it's some Russian word Uh, I'm just gonna skip it. Many problems with the AVT-40 have been reported, and most recently the Red Army determined that the automatic fire mode should not be used, as it makes the gun difficult to control and the increased strain has led to breakage. That's like having a couch you can't sit on, he says. Um, next we're talking about the MP-43 slash MP-44. Specifications, he says. I select die. I don't get it. Oh, select. It says select fire rifle. That's funny. Um, an improvement on current submachine guns. Sounds iffy, he says. Uh, we go to the FG42. Private Styles can talk about this stuff for hours as the United States continues. To to make advances in weapons technology, so too do our al adversaries. Let's see, how many beers did they have when they came up with this thing? Um, nevertheless, intelligence indicates that automatic fire of the FG-42 causes substantial muzzle rise. Another distinct design feature is a steeply slanted rearward rearward angled pistol grip on early FG42 rifles um later he also mentions uh i got to get primary defense differences implemented in the late model include a wooden buttstock relocation of the bipod from mid barrel to the muzzle and alteration of the grip from angle to vertical somebody finally sobered up he says um, let's see. The earliest incarnate... Now this is the grease gun, by the way. Um, the earliest incarnation of the weapon was intended for use in the Great War as a trench-clearing trench weapon, earning it two of what would become many nicknames, Trench Sweeper and Trench Broom. Time to clean up, huh, he says. Um, they make it sound so simple. Um, it is lighter than the M1928A1 and uses the same 45 caliber cartridge. Additionally, the M3 can be transformed to fire 9mm parabellum ammunition with a conversion kit. And now we talk about one of my favorite Russian SMGs, the PPSH-41. The PPSH-41, sometimes called the Pepesha, he says, 
Nope. <laughs> and that's what I'd say. Um, it is a blowback operated select selective fire submachine gun and largely from stamp steel and can be fed by either a box or drum magazine. And it's always hungry, he says. Let's see. The weapons use 7.63.25 millimeter ammunition that can be fed into the weapon without any conversion in place of the Soviet 7.62 by 25 millimeter Tokurov rounds. Additionally, the Germans have also modified the weapon to use the standard German submachine gun 9mm cartridge. Sneaky, he says. There we go. The PPSH-41 is, by all accounts, efficient and durable and features rates of higher than almost any other submachine gun currently in use. Yeah, but can it make me a sandwich? Honestly, whoever wrote this, I give them credit. This is great. This is just great reading material. Um, the MP28 now. Now this is a World War One weapon. Um, let's see. Going back. Uh, we go all the way back, in fact. Um, the only weapons we've seen in World War One in the Call of Duty franchise is this weapon, although it never existed during World War One. Uh, you know, three Springfield was always in World War One. The bayonet, the pistol, obviously, because the 1911 is the infamous pistol. The MP28 is a German submachine gun. It is a modification of the famous MP18. Famous, huh? Never heard of it. Well, you wouldn't. But your father might, because his was he was in the Great War. Um. This allows for the guns to be easily loaded while in the prone position. In case you're lying down on the job, he says. Let's see. The Lancaster or the Lanchester is a sturdy, well-made weapon featuring a wooden buttstock and a direct blowback operating mecha uh, mechanism, a lug for mounting the pattern M1907 bayonet, and a solid brass magazine housing. Crawley called them the Bentley of submachine guns. A specialized tool is used for magazine loading, a bobby pin. I don't know what that is, to be honest. And of course, the one weapon that takes up two pages for whatever reason, the Sten. In an event, in the event that you are called upon to fire a Sten. If jamming occurs, it will be necessary to clear the weapon. Can't argue with that logic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know why they bring that up. Another new weapon, the MG-15. Um, over the past several months, the MG-15 has been modified for use with ground units as it has been replaced by belt-fed machine guns such as the MG-81. Never heard of the 81. Following the Great War, the machine gun manufacturing in Germany was prohibited under the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the Krauts are carrying airplane guns now? What's next? Though, to be fair, the United States did that too. The M1919 Browning, that was an aircraft weapon. Same with the M2 Browning, which is an even bigger and heavier gun that's still in use today. For whatever reason, we don't use the M1919 Browning, but eh, it's a 30 caliber machine gun, who cares? Let's see. Um, it utilizes a modular, or I can't even read today, modular design that allows for components to be quickly swapped out and is fed via dual drum magazines, also known as a saddle drum, makes them easier to ride. Sounds like a pain, but I wouldn't mind shooting one. To prepare the MG-15 for ground support roll, additions include a single strut shoulder stock at the end of the receiver, a bipod, modified sights, and a carrying handle. Though the weapon is long and can be unwieldy on the battlefield, it is highly accurate. Okay. This one I don't get, and maybe, and I'm hoping this can explain it to me, but the Type 100, 
appears in this game, but it's a Japanese weapon. Russian weapons, I understand, because, you know, the Germans could have captured them. But a Type 100? This is a Japanese weapon. What's it doing on the European front, I wonder? All right. These mass-produced weapons began appearing in 1942 during the invasion of southern China. Poof, he says. U.S. soldiers who have acquired and used a Type 100 have reported firing stoppages and imbalance due to the top or due to the left side loading magazine. Happens to me after C rations, he says. One advantage of the Type 100 is that it is fairly lightweight. It also requires little familiarization, though the weapon uses a relatively weak Nambu pistol round. A might as well, he says, might as well use a slingshot. Now, here's another World War One weapon, except this is a mod different model. This is the 1941 variant, I'm assuming, given that, you know, 41. The trench knife. Trench knives are a carryover from the Great War. When trench fighting was common, the BC-41 is a trench knife favored by British commandos. It is also a combination of brass knuckles and dagger, purpose built for those for close quarters fighting. Also makes a great can opener, he says. Early expectations held that the current conflict would see a return to trench warfare. The BC-41 was created with previous successful trench knife designs in mind. Paws knife is one of the most important items I brought with me, he says. Um... And we're going to circle this. To allow for trigger pulling while holding the knife. Um, this is what the British did. British soldiers removed the, fir the first loop of the grip in order to allow the for trigger pulling while holding the knife. And he says, hey, smart, cap with exclamation points. All right. Now, the MK2 grenade, this combines both the grenade and like the frag grenade and the smoke grenade except this was used in world war one i'm not so sure about this one they had smoke but i don't think they had it in canisters yet so the mk2 has been in use since 1918 when it replaced the flawed mark one the fastball's a killer he says i don't care as long as it works uh, fuses vary between M5 and M6, detonating fuses for grenades with a high explosive TNT filler, and M10 igniting fuses for grenades with a low explosive black powder filler. The grenade safety pin is cr crimped to hold it in place to operate the grenade, pull the pin, and release the spoon. No shit. I mean, what else would you use it for? Alright, um... We only have one thing on the smoke grenade. The M16 smoke grenade is a smoke grenade available in the following colors. Green, purple, red, white, yellow, blue, orange, and black. Smoke I didn't know they had black. Smoke grenades are used as a signaling device to mark a target for close air support or to provide concealment. Colors used for various operations will vary depending on units and situations. Styles likes to use them when he's making fo when he's taking photos. Says so it adds atmosphere. So in other words, he wastes government property. Okay. Uh, now going on to the S mine, or commonly known as the Bouncing Betty. The mine, also known as a Bouncing Betty, or in German, Shrapnel Mine, Spring Mine, or Splitter Mine, is part of a category of mines known as Bounding Mines, mines that are propelled into the air before detonation. Pretty much the scariest thing you can think of. Yeah, it's pretty damn scary. The S-Mine is... Oh, wait, hang on. The S-Mine is infamous for inflicting severe wounds to the extremities and genitals. Ooh. <laughs> I get the same reaction myself. Ah, damn. Um, we go back. Time between the triggering of the propellant and ignition of the main charge is four seconds. I can run pretty far in four seconds, he says. Okay, we're... I feel like we're getting close. We have to be getting close. Run! 
page 48 and 49 right now. And nope, we're not even close. Great. So we're talking about the flamethrower now. Early on, two experimental models were developed. The E1 consisted of a fuel storage system, compressed gas storage system, igniter, and flame gun. It used one vertical fuel tank cylinder with an upper and lower compartment. Pressurized nitrogen in the upper compartment sent five gallons of fuel oil into the lower compartment and into the flame gun. Sounds pretty safe, he says. Uh, the fuel tank was composed of two large vertical fuel bottles and a third. They make great enemy targets, he says. Thinner tank worn together as a backpack for propellant. Improvements were made to the flame gun, valves, and ignition syst and an ignition system. They can still fail to light. I heard about a guy who had had to light one with a cigarette. Wow. Recent developments have led it to an entirely new flammable liquid, napalm. Napalm is a mixture of fuel and a gelling agent that sticks to various surfaces, including skin, and burns at a steady rate. Has a real interesting smell, he says. Um, the biggest change to be seen in the M2 is a cartridge-based ignition system replacing the older battery-actuated spark system. In initial reports indicate that the new ignition system is the most reliable to date. That's not saying much, he says. We see the M2 flamethrower. Alright, the M1 anti-tank rocket launcher. The M1... <laughs> yeah, I, I say the... Oh, wait. The M1 anti-tank ro rocket launcher is a recoilless rocket launcher that is primarily used as an anti-tank weapon. It also extremely is also extremely effective against armored vehicles, gun nests, and bunkers. And he says, like tanks? The M1, and he abbreviates, or annotates with, don't they use this name for pretty much everything? Yes. Yes, they do. The M1 Bayonet, the M1 Grand, the M1 Bazooka. It's, it's a cluster. It's just a mess. Okay, the Panzer Schreck, Fausch, Patron, Patrone, and Panzerfaust. Panzerfaust. The Panzer Schreck is an enemy anti tank weapon designed based on examples of the US M1 ATRL captured in North Africa and Sicily early in the war. I thought they looked similar or familiar. Oh my god. Racket and Panzer Schreck. Busha, the anti-tank launcher is also known as, or RPZB, RPZB-43 was the first Panzer Shrek model. Now you're just punching typewriter keys, he says. Upon firing, a driving rod will strike a punch generator that will complete a circuit and ignite the rocket motor. Hey, it's not rocket science. Oh, wait. <laughs> Um, also be aware that Panzer Shrek produces a great deal of smoke and will certainly give away our, your position. It is not recommended to fire the Panzer Shrek indoors. I suppose lighting myself on fire is a bad idea too. Yes, very much. The Panzer Faust Armor Fist or Tank Fist, and he says, make up your mind. Are single shot recoilless German anti tank weapons that use they use a much smaller launch tube than the Panzer Shrek and are meant to be used by a single person. Married folks are out of luck. That's funny. That actually was pretty good. Alright. I'm not even gonna begin to try and figure out what that says. I'm just gonna call it the Flak 88 because that's what everybody knows it by. The 88 millimeter or 8.8 centimeter gun is also sometimes called the 88 or the 88 millimeter flak where flak stands for Flugzeuge Bewegungen Flug meaning fly or an aircraft defense cannon I don't even think the Krauts understand what this means he says 
Under the terms of the Versailles Treaty that governed the post-war period, Germany was banned from developing certain weapons. But by using foreign com companies, further improvements to existing weapons were made. The prototype model Flak 18 was given the 18 designation to fool Versailles, the Versailles Treaty monitors, in thinking the new gun was a copy of an older M1918 model. And he says, look up the MG15 um, to see how well that worked. Um, the Flak 18 fires high explosive armor piercing and high explosive anti tank ammunition at a rate of 15 to 20 rounds per minute. Thing sounds pretty nasty, he says. And it was. It was a pain in the ass for Allied bombers. Now, here's the big. Here's the interesting one. Now, fun fact that they probably don't mention in this book this rocket. Without it, we would not have been able to take our first photo in space. Because this is the rocket they used. So this is the V-2 rocket. Alright. These projects were reportedly undergone, or er, have reportedly undergone development in a top-secret Nazi facility on a secluded island in the Baltic Sea last year. Movie people can't even make this stuff up. Um, British intel intense bombing by the Royal Air Force inflicted heavy damage but failed to destroy the site completely. Time to go back, he says. Allied bombings have thus far only been partially su successful in neutralizing these sites. It is speculated that the V-1 will utilize a pulse jet engine and autopilot system. What the hell's that? Good question. Many people know. Don't know. No launch sites for the A-4 are known at this time, and none have been used against the Allies yet, but it appears to be the only matter of time. Don't sugarcoat it. I'm a big boy, he says. And of course, because it's a classified document, none of these things would be known. Because no one knows. Alright, we're getting close to the end, and I think I'm going to stop it here for tonight, because, again, this was a really long chapter, and I didn't really want to talk too much.